Okay, so I hope that you can hear me well. Um, today we are going to have another webinar. So after we have a quite long break, um, we have Sven Kroon here from ICAST. He, also, he is also a member of um, our center, Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. Um, and he will be talking about forecasting with the second generation of AI, avoiding pitfall from algorithm, data, runtime, and management expectation. So we, before we start our um, webinar, this is basically um, our center. So we provide um, services um, in short courses, consultancy, summer project, and also PhD project. We also have a lot of uh, expertise in marketing analytics, demand forecasting, um, sales and operation planning, inventory management, machine learning, and statistical learning. Um, and also these are our um, channels. So basically our um, um, marketing um, channels. So you can contact us via Twitter, um, LinkedIn, or email or we can you can also visit our website we also have youtube um, um yeah a few days ago i think um, there is a new video about um retail forecasting um, yeah and then also the last bit is uh, the, the 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 website of our center okay so i think it's it's enough from the center then i will give the um the floor to swen so thanks a lot, Kanrika. Hey, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I'm in presenter mode, so I can't see you, uh, but um, hopefully we'll have some time for discussions later on um, to talk about a topic that, that, that I, I think is really quite important at the moment. What I want to speak about is forecasting with AI. That's, my, that's the thing that I like to present about, as, as some of you have seen in the past. Um, and I want to present about forecasting with the second generation of AI. This is a joint project we did together with Biasdorf. And this is a presentation that I did at the IBF conference in Amsterdam with Chris Cole, um, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm taking some of the material from there. Um, I just wanted to pay um, uh, to give reference to that, but Chris can't join us today. Um, having said that, most of you might be excited to hear about the second generation of AI. You know, what is this? This is, um, uh, you know, deep neural networks, convolutional networks, LSTMs. Um, what are the, the more recent um, innovations that we have? Deep, you know, uh, generative AI. Uh, unfortunately, not. I, my point is actually that we're we're often trying to forecast with the third generation of AI, how I how I would coin it, deep neural networks. But the second generation seems to sometimes work quite well. And this is a real world project. We've been working with Biasdorf in forecasting for a number of years, and we I want to share with you some of the some of the pitfalls that we encountered because despite doing this for a number of years and being live. We actually almost managed to fail in the project because of all the challenges that you have in technology adoptions. Now, I'm a, I'm a lecturer at Lancaster University and a member of the Research Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting many years. But some years ago, we created a spin-off company where we used all the research um, from, from all the various members of, of the, the center and put it into a tool uh, which we can plug into the back of um, large advanced planning systems we call that ICAST. So it's uh, mostly leveraging AI and machine learning techniques, but also statistics and other things that uh, um, innovations that people in the department have been coming up with. So I'll, I'll share some of it with you. Um, in essence, what what ICAST does is, um, given the whole, I think it was very hard to to miss this hype about AI, right? And and I think um, it started out with pattern recognition and speech, and now we we've, we've all come to accept that you can all. Uh, talk to your car and your mobile phone and dictate things. It's, it's really quite helpful. Then the big revolution came in pattern recognition and images and pictures and um, recognizing individual objects, starting with cats and dogs and then moving on. Um, and also anomaly detection. So not only detecting patterns in uh, in pictures, but detecting anomalous patterns, which is quite important if you think about that. And um, then, of course, most recently, with the transform architecture pattern recognition and text. Now we don't at ICAST, we don't do anything as complicated. Uh, we just borrow some of the ideas of pattern recognition and we try to do pattern recognition in, in time series, mostly of supply chain and logistics companies. So these are some examples. You can just see from the from we often talk about forecasting if it's a single discipline, but electricity data is significantly different from 
financial data is different from logistics data is different from retail data is different from fast moving consumer goods data so those of you that are working in the industry might be familiar with that i'm just giving you three time series of uh, client projects we did ab InBev, beer beer forecasting um you know very seasonal very much driven by external events very much driven by european championships football rugby in the uk um, bank holidays of course weather um, weather being sunshine, but also cloud cover. Um, on the other hand side, logistics, container import and output data um, uh, from Hapag Lloyd, you know, importing containers into ports and exporting them out of ports. Uh, very different patterns that you can see here, much to do with also bank holidays, Chinese New Year, but also other things like uh, schedule disruptions, recovery activities, um, and biased of what we'll talk about today. Uh, so aggregate monthly data in supply chain management, some seasonality, but trends, disruptions, out of stocks, um, very few out of stocks, um, but there still could be quite important and promotional activities. So you can see they all have different things in common. So it's um, it's a complex problem, although probably not as complicated as recognizing patterns in pictures or, or speech. And that's maybe uh, one of the things, by the way. Um, we didn't just start after GPTs leverage all the technology and we're able to show that you can do recognition text on pattern recognition. Um, but this actually goes back to research in the 1960s. I mean, if you see the, the grumpy looking gentleman in the middle, that's Frank Rosenblatt. And you can see how grump, why he was so grumpy in front of him is a huge pile of, of uh, wires, which he actually had to use to build neural networks and to connect neural networks. And um, so this is these are manually connected neural networks already back in the 1950s, and 1960s of the last century. And of course, we have had applications in image recognition uh, and in voice recognition, but and some early tries in text recognition, but at a much lower scale all throughout the 80s. And that's basically when I wrote my PhD thesis uh, or started to read about the, the research. And so much of this we'll, we'll have a look at today. So just maybe a general thing, how AI actually sees. So optical character recognition, you know, uh, has been applied widely in history since since the 1980s. The US Post Office used it. So it wasn't the humans anymore that read the letters. They were actually digitized and then they were um, they did optical character recognition. And how do they do it? Well, they use neural networks already. You can see here on the left hand side is a little um, just to explain what how these these neural networks learn is an image that gets digitized, right? So you have a number eight and it gets digitized into um, 28 by 28 uh, pixels, so 784 pixels altogether. And then you simply record the the average grayscale in that particular pixel, which if if there's somebody's written something there, it's typically inverted so that uh, white gets very dark and then that gets the number zero so that you have very little inputs. Um, and then the thing that is written, the, the pattern of interest actually gets high value. So it's anything between one and 255. Um, and, and that basically is how you encode a, a written, a handwritten uh, character. And that is then fed to an algorithm, a neural network already in the 80s with 784 pixels without any knowledge that the top left pixel, how that's related to the middle pixel or the bottom pixel. They, all, they don't have any geo, geospatial representation which is something that later on in more advanced technologies, people were able to exploit if you think about convolutions. But um, at that time, you just fed it in and then you had a supervised training problem. These were handwritten character data sets that were available for to train neural networks on. And we know this is an eight, so we would actually use that information to adjust the weights. So the next time the neural network would see an eight, it would make less of a mistake. And if it's a three, which is quite looks similar to an eight, um, then it would be trained to that. So you do the input output mapping between that. And we were able to do that for all the characters. What we weren't able to do or what, what researchers weren't able to do is recognize much more complicated pictures like cats and dogs, which is what um, some of the breakthroughs were in. And it, it really um, required multi-layered networks, much more complex with additional um, information processing layers, like convolutional neural networks in this case, that allowed you to actually do digitize it. The, the, the way to do it is quite the same. And they started out with cats versus dogs uh, in some occasions with deep networks, but um, there were also other um, neural network topologies that got applied. And um, of course, by now it's been extended to 25,000 uh, classes that you can do. So not just two classes here. It's a classification problem, not a regression problem. But what I wanted to show is that with the data getting more complicated, actually the neural networks grew more complicated, more complex. We now have newer networks that actually are trained on, on billions of images and have hundreds of millions of parameters in order to recognize these kind of patterns. 
but the training process is the same. They all learn from examples, not from rules. And so it's if you don't have an if data, then you can't really do any learning. And just bear that in mind until later on, because in supply chain forecasting or in probably outside of electricity and financial forecasting, many areas of forecasting, you don't have as much unlimited data available as you have because you're, rec re you're recording aggregate um, demand or prices or sales of objects that simply don't have that much granularity or history. So how does it translate back to forecasting? Well, for, if you think of a time series, you might as well think of a time series as an image as well, but it's just, uh, it's not as rich, right? It's actually, um, basically it's just a vector and and we would normally snippet this up in, into autoregressive kind of vectors that we then present to the neural network and we would train it. So the network, rather than learn the input between a cat and a dog picture and a classification, a class membership, um, it would actually learn the input output mapping between, let's say, the last 12 months of, in this case, airline passenger data and the next 12 months or the next six months of airline passenger data. That's the kind of mapping. But you can see that these pictures are much simpler. So these kind of things we were able to do already with much smaller vectors and with much smaller algorithms. So one of the second things to bear in mind until later on is like, do we really need these really big and complex neural networks? if we're doing training on individual time series, right? I'm not going into uh, global learning or uh, um, learning where you, or transfer learning where you actually learn on a whole range of data sets and then want to do a zero shot uh, forecasting. But um, bearing that in mind, the, the algorithm size might have to match the data set. So just to show you how this works, uh, this is an old example, right? I'm getting to the project in a second. Um, this is actually a neural network, a very simple one, purely autoregressive, 13 inputs to capture 12 month seasonality and a trend. And um, you can see on the on desk area here, you can see the time series. So after each training step, I'm actually outputting the forecast, which is the red line for the training part. Yellow is validation and green is test. So it never sees test, it uses validation for early stopping. And if you now fast forward this, well, not really fast forward because I've actually slowed it down. It actually trains in a less than a microsecond, uh, but then we wouldn't be able to see anything. You can actually see what the network learns. It actually first learns the level then it learns the slope of the trend and now it starts to learn the seasonality. And uh, in the bottom left corner, you can actually see the errors on the training training validation and test partitions, how they decrease. And now you all know that the challenges in overfitting from polynomial regression and, and, and econometric model building, right? So we can just add, simply add more and more variables. In the same way for neural network, we can train it indefinitely and um, approximate any Borel measurable function to any desired degree of accuracy if you wanted to. So. We often withhold a part of the data, a validation data set, and we measure how the data, how the forecast or the approximation in sample increases. Um, so how the error in sample is reduced. And then we will also measure how the error out of sample is reduced at the same time. But at some point when the network starts to memorize the training, the training data, we, we hypothesize that the error on the validation data will increase, the, the error on validation will no longer decrease, and that's when we do something like early stopping. There are many ways to generalize uh, um, and to regularize newer networks and training uh, um, explicitly through early stopping and a variety of other things. But you can see generally that the errors at the bottom have gotten uh, much smaller and are developing down, and it's, it's basically learning this pattern. Um, I think we can look at this slightly more rigorously in a um, we, let me restart this again, and then we'll rather than looking at the residuals, we actually look at the autocorrelation function of the residuals, right? So this is actually what's left uh, at the end. But let's start this again. So the neural network learns the autocorrelation. You can see it doesn't even know the level yet. Next, it learns the trend. So the autocorrelation function will show the decrease of the trend component. So now um, basically we have stationary residuals, but well, not stationary. They still have seasonality. And now it will start to learn the seasonality, and you can see how actually the seasonality, uh, um, the cyclical seasonality pattern that you see here uh, from the airline passenger data is being learned step by step. So just to show that that new networks in a very simple autoregressive formulation can actually learn a lot of time series patterns and I have been able to do so for a long time, even a very simple network that is not a transformer. These are multi-layer perceptrons like they were built in the 1980s, 1990s, the workhorses of forecasting. So they're like the equivalent of exponential smoothing in the in the AI world when it comes to classification and, and other things up until the breakthrough of deep networks. And um, you can see how that approximates. So um, I think that's great. But one of the topics of the talk today is that um, that we almost failed, right? What are the pitfalls? And there are quite a few pitfalls of AI in practice. Uh, 
if you look at uh, Forbes or Gartner uh, and others, and there's actually a lot of machine learning and AI projects seem to fail. People quote numbers as high as 87 percent. And um, even in forecasting with AI, there was some business models out there. Zillow, for example, tried to forecast house prices more accurately than humans could and therefore purchase houses at a, at a narrow margin where uh, they would they would still presume to make profit over time, understanding about the, the micro properties of, of them. But they basically blamed it on fa on profit. Um, I think um, the algorithm at, at hand at the time, which probably wasn't made for house prices, to be fair to um to Facebook's uh, um, development team uh, that developed Profit. But um, they basically blamed it on the algorithm and said, well, I mean, the, the algorithm was bad, so we had to lay off a quarter of our staff and almost went bankrupt. So AI projects um, fail. And if you remember the cat and dog example, yes, deep networks were trained to, to determine uh, the difference between cats and dogs, which is amazing because we weren't able to do that with conventional programming at the time. But um, they also had what they call adversarial attacks or fakes which um, confused the networks. And the, so some of the early deep neural networks couldn't, they could differentiate a cat from a dog, they couldn't differentiate a, a chihuahua from a blueberry muffin, which I think is probably easier uh, for a human, but um, although some of them look pretty cute, the blueberry muffins. Um, but the same thing they also found out, Labradoodles versus fried chickens, sheep dogs and mops, puppies bagels, sheep marshmallows. There were lots of examples where a neural network had simply learned that if there's snow in the background, it's probably a husky. Or um, indeed, that if there were blue skies, there's an early early example of um, uh, um, of hostile tank recognition. Uh, typically, these pictures were made under blue skies because you just didn't have anything that was obfuscated. So there is a lot of evidence of these projects failing. So that's what we did. Um, that's why we embarked. And when we we did a miniature survey, um, has your company tried forecasting with AI in the in the past? The numbers have gone up. We did another survey quite a long time ago. I have a link for the survey later on, so uh, bear with me to the last slide. But when we asked companies, they have more, the majority of them had already done some AI forecasting, and 55% uh, had not done anything yet, but 45 had embarked on it. 26 were running in a pilot or proof of concept, so they hadn't gone live yet, right? You typically uh, engage in this by trying to say, okay, does it actually work on my data? So you do a proof of concept. Once you have a proof of concept, which is typically done on historical data, you then do a pilot run in parallel, try to understand month in, month out, you know, like doing a three month ahead forecast. How does the accuracy compare in vivo, right, uh, to, to the established statistical algorithms that you have? And then, or the human human experts that actually make judgmental overrides. And But what was quite worrying at the time is that to see that whilst 6% were running in production, 13% had stopped them after some trials. So we actually had more projects fail than actually running in production, which is also something that we saw in the other areas of, of, of AI projects, you know, in image recognition, in industry of um, IoT data analysis. Um, and when we asked people, why do you think projects fail? Um, some of them said, yeah, well, the AI algorithms are not really accurate. Um, that, but that was uh, you know, only 11%, right? 6% blaming on the team. Most of them actually said it's the lack of available data. It's a very small survey, right? It's just a feeling, um, um, just to, just to uh, uh, give you a bit of the, the vibe that people that had um, looked at forecasts and had failed with their project. And it's a small sample. And by the way, when we attend the IBF conferences or other companies like Corporate Parity, there are of two, 300 companies in the room of practitioners very few indeed, less than a handful are actually live with forecasting with AI. So it is um, early days and we're trying to figure out what's the problem is. So I think we can say that a lot of some consultants also took part in here. So they often blame the data quality, but often I think it's it's a bit more subtle. The algorithms are there, but they don't really match the data. And I think that's what I want to explore. So our business case is biased off. Those of you that are not familiar with biased off, which probably you, if you are, um, they don't actually sell their products under the name Biostorf. They sell them under the names of Userin on Nivea, La Prairie, Hansa Plast. Um, they're active um, in 170 countries worldwide. They're roughly making nine million euros in uh, nine billion euros in in a turnover in 2022, and um, they they have been um, really quite. You know, they've really invested heavily into statistical forecasting, analytical forecasting, enhancing the process. I think they're really a very, very good example 
uh, going back at over well over 10 years and trying to enhance forecasting. So they've given training to well over 500 demand planners worldwide. So um, quite an investment made. Um, these are some of the time series to give you an understanding a little bit of, of their forecasting challenges. They're using SAP APO. Uh, they're still using it. They're, uh, they're switching to a new system um, in the coming years. But uh, these are some of the old slides with uh, SAP APO. You can see that the patterns, they have trends, they have seasonality. They roughly have 50,000 active items. Um, they have 150 global demand planners all working and forecasting in the system. Many of them use statistical forecasting. On average, a planner has roughly 350 items they need to plan, but it can go up to 1,200 items. So you see the need how, that they need to automate uh, forecasting, right? Within a monthly process, and you have to forecast every month, forecasting 18 months in the future, and you know production planning basically is looking at a sweet spot one, two, and three months out. Um, if you think about that, you cannot do that manually anymore with 1,200 products. Even with 350, it would be quite demanding because you still need to do a lot of other things, you know, get judgment, overlay information on, on top of the statistical forecast, correct the history, annotate things. So if you have a product relaunch or successor product, you need to connect all that in the system. So the, the demand planning job is, is much more diverse than just pressing a button and running some statistical forecast. What they have achieved, though, which I think is, um, if, if you think about their, their product assortment, 82% are standard items. They have some promo items, which are heavily purely promoted items, 10% uh, new product introduction. Um, and of, of those, they actually have 67% uh, on uh, of the of the standard items they have on statistical forecasting. Um, they implement ABC, XYZ, so they understand that some of the items are very volatile and they just don't need a, a statistical forecast. They just forecast it manually. Um, and if you're thinking about um, the 67, roughly 70 percent, two thirds of the data being statistically forecasted, they actually have quite a lot which um, have had a fully uh, fully automatic model selection with which we, we help them uh, with iCast and some of them actually make manual overrides. So a demand planner can still make a manual override to the statistical model saying, no, I really don't want a trend in here. I want to have a seasonal model. So you can see how, um, how they're also able to engage with the statistical analytical engine. And um, this is one of the early POCs we did. We presented that back at Dubai at a conference many years ago. This is a problem that they got the Biostop approached us with many years. And um, they basically said, well, we have this, I think it was a lip gloss product that has a funny double seasonality. You know, you have a summer seasonality when in the summer uh, for, for lip stop, you know, against dry lips, basically. And you have a winter seasonality as well in some countries. And some of the methods that were available in, in uh, SAP APO um, simply weren't able to, to to handle this well. Some of them had zeros, they had out of stock, so then um, exponential smoothing, some of the methods with multiplicative seasonality actually didn't work because you cannot divide by zero, so you had to cleanse a lot of the history. Seasonal linear regression, which is an algorithm, um, I think it comes from the Coca-Cola company that actually decomposes the time series um, with, with a classical decomposition, fits a linear regression line to it, and then recomposes it. Uh, was actually one of the best the most robust algorithms for that roughly had an error these are the purple forecast so if you don't have 12 months of history of course you can't create a forecast but then as soon as you have 12 months you can actually replicate the previous seasonality decompose it forecast it and re um, reintroduce the decomposition on top of it and these are the purple forecast you can see they're pretty rigid you know, decent forecast but um uh, not really getting the peaks and troughs right um the human planners for this particular item made an override was able to add 6% forecast value on top of that. So forecast value add might be a thing that many of you are familiar with, uh, but we were able to train a neural network on it and improve forecast accuracy by over, uh, um, by significantly, right? Reduce error by half, so going to 9%. That is not representative. That is that is where a neural network achieves superhuman accuracy. But to be fair, um, uh, the, the planner had to forecast 1,000, over 1,000 items of this. We actually rolled this out already. And uh, we were able to show that, of course, we weren't able to re to half the error. You can half the error sometimes, and some software vendors actually are a bit cheeky. They say, "Oh, we can up to we can reduce your error by up to fifty percent." Yeah, but not everything is seasonal in the world, right? So we knew that, and and depending on the seasonality, the types of seasonality, we actually were able to reduce error quite a bit. For example, in Canada and in Germany, but not so much in France or in Greece, for example. So on average, it was a seven and a half percent reduction overall and um, so I think that's uh, it's, it's a good improvement but it, it's not a 50% improvement to bear in mind 
And uh, maybe just to show you that, by the way, this is a, an old project we did. Some of you might be interested in, in, in how, how demanding it is to work together with a, with a university or a small consultancy company like us as a spin-off. And uh, the software costs are fairly moderate, the installation is moderate. The modeling and training of standard algorithms at the time was cheap. So I think there was a return on investment for seven and a half percentage points in accuracy globally was that was in months rather than rather than in many years. And it didn't fail, right? So we went live for this just to show, maybe show you these are some of the folk, these are some of the time series of biased off. Um, they were actually forecasting. It's exactly the same neural network I showed you before that that learned the airline passenger data, purely autoregressive. No feature extraction, no feature generation, nothing like that. And uh, you can see how the, I mean, the airline passenger is one of the most beautifully crafted time series that exists out there, right? But um, they're not all that that well behaved. And you can see here the neural network actually now you have an autoregressive uh, uh, autoregressive lag structure, um, but you have noise in there, you have outliers in there, you have structural breaks, level shifts. You can see that. Training still continues, right? So we still reduce the error in sample, um, but not necessarily out of sample. Um, and there's quite a few other examples, but for, for going to the next time series or forwarding on to the next one, um, you will actually see that it will have a different pattern. It's the same neural network architecture and it will just approximate the different seasonality also as well. Now, we've actually done quite a bit of tests between a purely autoregressive ARIMA model, right? Like an AR or ARI model. Um, without any moving average terms, and um, you would probably find out that uh, these are much harder to specify. So the neural network seems to be doing quite a bit of um, quite a bit of uh, approximation, despite being completely overspecified. Uh, we all know, for example, the airline passenger model is a 011011 model, and there's an interesting post by Ivan recently about um, specifying ARIMA models uh, and constraining the search space for a meaningful, much more meaningful accuracy and improved speed. So uh, these are definitely misspecified models, but the neural network still seems to be able to learn the underlying pattern despite the presence of outliers pretty well. And those of you that understand the structure and the algorithms a bit, uh, you know they, they have sigmoid activation functions, so they can't really um, ex you know, they don't really lead to any explosive behavior. Um, they probably rather converge. There's redundancy built in. So I think talking uh, about this, the um, Talking about the properties of neural networks, I think talking about accuracy is probably not the whole story. Talking about robustness is an important one, and and other things. But I don't want to go too deep into the technical rabbit hole. This is supposed to be like a practical example. I think if I just fast forward to one of the time series that actually does not have any seasonality at all, you can see that of course, if the neural network actually learns this, it it does not manage to to find any seasonal patterns in there. It will actually extrapolate a straight line forecast with a bit of overfitting, unfortunately. But given the amount of randomness, I think that's there. So, so it's capable of one neural network structure was able to learn all different data patterns that were there. Sometimes better than a statistical model, sometimes not. But um, it was able to learn all of the patterns directly from the data. So we don't have to do any model selection, which really was one of the main challenges in SAP APO, that the human planner had to sit down and think about, is this a seasonal item? Yes or no? If this is a seasonal item, I'm going to pick a seasonal whole winters model, or I'm going to put, put, uh, select a seasonal trend seasonal a linear regression model. Or if it's not constant, if it's only a constant model, I would actually pick just a constant model. So model selection was a time consuming pass, and we were able to to improve that quite a bit with the neural networks that learned this directly. So this might look nice, but this is 10 years old. So Biostock actually approached us and said, we actually need to do a new project, it's 10 years in the making. So uh, why don't we build the second generation of AI models? And that is the project that we set out to do to enhance what I just showed you before. The stuff that they had been there since, um, well, since 2013, uh, we were live, 2012, we started developing it. And, um, we said, yeah, great, let's do that. It's a, it's a nice project, you know, after 10 years, that's that's at least two generations of algorithms. We now have all these breakthroughs with transformers and image recognition. So what more data do you have? And I, I want to kind of like outline the blockers that we encountered in the project, because when we did the original project, Biostoff did not really collect any uh, um, information about promotions in a systematic way. They didn't have historical prices in a systematic way, but that was two, that was 15, well, you know, 2000, 2014, 2012. That's like 12 years ago. So 
OK, we said, great, now we have a new project. So you have sun products, you have um, deodorant, shower gels. Um, you, they are out of stocks. They have COVID was there. We have supply chain disruptions all around the planet. So uh, we said, OK, let's let's look at what new data do you have. And this is the data that we had in 2012. There wasn't a demand signal repository. There weren't historical prices. There were no promo mechanics. What you did, you know, it's a buy one, get one free. It's an unpack. It's, you know, done with a 40 percent market share retailer. Um, so the good news was, what did they collect in 2022 when we started this? Exactly the same. There was no improvement in the data. And, well, the data quality had improved, but we still didn't have a data demand signal repository. So we're still stuck with the same data. And I think that's typical of many AI projects that we embark with with companies that even something as important as out of stocks um, or order book data or, um, or, or price data, promotional types, historical forecast from customers are not retained in a manageable way. And if you have seasonality in the data, if you have if you have a, um, a spike towards the end of Christmas, you need to observe that spike a few times, you know, in a retail environment. Some, you may have a warm Christmas, a cold Christmas, a Christmas disrupted by COVID. So you probably need three or four or five years with historical promo information. If you don't have that, you basically only have time series data. And that is one of the limitations. Actually, if you put this into perspective, the data set I showed you to train the neural network on, that's from, from Bob Brown, 1963, or Box and Jenkins, the airline passenger data. So we easily had 12 or 13 years of historical data, right? Macroeconomic data, so looking at the total number of airline passengers. But when we see data sets that we receive today, and people are excited, they have an AI budget, they say, wow, we want to forecast demand with AI. We get three years or three and a half years of historical data, right? So the data sets are shorter and smaller than they used to be in the 1960s. Okay, now we're forecasting disaggregate demand. So these are micro time series that we used to do macroeconomic forecasting. But if you think about it, you have three Christmases, you have three Easter's which are moving about. How much do you expect a newer network to learn? So these are seasonal time series at the bottom. How much do you expect a nonlinear algorithm to interpolate if you have three data points? Right. I mean, how smart do you want to get with, you know, if you have three Easter's, you basically have three dummy variables to characterize Easter. There's not much nonlinearity you can find in those kind of patterns, can you? Um, in particular, when you don't have any temperature or even if you have temperature. But um, that's the first thing. And uh, we did a survey already quite a long time ago now, 2017, where 72 percent of um, of the, the survey respondents, actually there's roughly 300 companies, said, how much data to use? Well, we use three years of monthly data. That was it. Nobody knows why. It is a standard setting in many of the APO systems of, le of yesteryear. Um, and the reason was, by the way, um, simply one of a um, lot of convenience. But if you had to everything in live cache, if you had to have everything in memory, there's simply the computers weren't big enough in order to have 10 or 20 years of data to retain or to save additional variables. Today, we should have the capabilities, but it wasn't really there. So uh, we also found in the survey that up to 20 internal external data sources were used, but mostly judgmentally because they were all in a different format exchanged by email and Excel. Uh, but that's not that's not the whole point, right? If you have time series, even the companies that we work with that have time series that have five years of data, um, you can easily see that there's, you know, that in this case, for example, there's an out of stock, there's a seasonal diagram. So there seems to be um, hardly anything sold. And then there's a, a catch up business, right? But how are events such as stockouts recorded in a meaningful way, right? Um, how are rare events like promotions recorded? So not only do we have limited data, we also have sparse data labels on the time series data from which we could correct correct or create variables. So this is really one of the most important things we try to engage companies in is to build up a demand signal repository to actually have exogenous data because neural networks can handle those. Um, exponential smoothing can also handle them with, if you build intervention models or and even many of the standard packages today can do this. But um, you know, building ETS um, intervention models, Arimax models, um, those were available for well over 10 years, but people didn't record it. So if you think about this, the, 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 this revolution taking place with AI, then I think we have a massive exponential growth of CPU power, exponential growth in the size of algorithms, and we have much less than exponential growth. We have probably a decrease in, in the size or no movement at all in the size of data sets in forecasting. And that is why forecasting and AI is falling behind. Some people say we're drowning in algorithms but we're hungry for data. So how can we get more data? That was really the problem that we had. 
Um, we'll, we'll get back to that a little bit later on, right? But let's think about it, not, not enough data. So if we had the data we had, the second blocker we found that, um, okay, we have the same data as 10, 12 years ago. Let's have a look at all the new algorithms. And we unfortunately realized that most of the standard AI algorithms, the newer, deep neural networks, they didn't really work on sparse data. Um, so let's have a look at that, right? I think when we look at the evolution of AI algorithms, we have to go back to the 1950s with the applications, right? Adelines, perceptrons, already able to do optical character recognition, able to do sonar decoupling, uh, um, detecting infant heart rates, ECGs and so forth. Amazing things they did in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, there's, a, there's a link here for a video in Science in Action by Bernie Widrow from the 1950s. I highly recommend you watch that. The 1990s, the first generation of multi-layer perceptrons was able to do optical character recognition and, and all these things. So that for me, that was the, the, maybe some people say that's the second generation already multi-layer perceptrons. For me, that was the first time they actually were applied in industry widely, going back to the Minsky Papert shooting down perceptrons and then Rummelhart McClellan in 1986, basically showing with back propagation how they can be trained. Although, of course, backpropagation had been invented by Paul Werbos already in the 1970s. It's a PhD thesis at Harvard in you know, ordered forecasting with ordered derivatives, actually in economic forecasting. So the first neural network application of a multi-layer perceptron was in forecasting. But well, as with most PhD theses, hardly anybody read it. The second generation of AI were really, you know, trying to develop the methodology how to get these to work. And certainly in forecasting, that's where, where I spend a lot of my time and research on trying to figure out, you know, what actually works. Ensembles work and bagging works, but boosting doesn't work. How do you generate features? What are the parameters you do? How do you specify the input vector? Um, quite a few of the things, you know, borrowing ideas from econometrics. And then the third generation in 2015, convolutional neural networks, NBEADS, deep transformers and so forth. What I don't know what the next generation is going to be, but so which generation do you think Biostoff wanted to go live with um, when they paid us to, to do this? Not, not the first generation of AI, definitely not the zeroth generation, but to, we, of course they wanted to explore the latest algorithms that are out there. Um, and so were we. So we actually did that and uh, we tried to figure out what is actually hyped at the moment. So we looked at all the R algorithms out there um, and we also looked at all the Python algorithms that were out there, but they were a little bit harder to implement at the time. So I can't show you those results yet. We're still working on, on doing that. Uh, so some of the important competitors are not here. AWS, DeepAR, uh, we evaluated, but not in a global setting, but in an individual setting. Um, Google's, uh, um, uh, Facebook's profit is in here. Google's BSTS is in here. And we basically looked at the most popular algorithms. Most of those were still dominated by statisticians, you know, Rob Heintman um, from Monash University has some of the most widely used packages, of course, Ivan's packages from Lancaster in there as well, Nikos's package as well. Um, we, we were agnostic. We said, let's use a neural network or any algorithm that actually works. And uh, so we try to codify that. We didn't really compare to commercial software packages because it's always hard to get that clearance, um, but it would be interesting. And by the way, the, the main contestant for some people don't know that is for us the naive. I've seen many new network papers in financial forecasting, particularly where you know the forecast looks really good. It looks exactly like the actuals. It's just shifted in time a bit. Yeah, and that's that's basically that's a naive forecast or a random walk, right? That's the one of the that's the worst forecast you can have. That's you can't be worse than that, right? Going back to pharma and French efficient capital markets theorem. Um, but they should be able to outperform uh, in supply chain data when you have seasonality, when you have trends. But it's a very suitable benchmark. I think if you don't, you cannot outperform the naive, then you certainly have a problem with either with your data or with the way that you're approaching the algorithms. Um, it's also nice because it nowadays links to the forecast value added um, analysis that people are doing, measuring judgmental adjustments versus the naive, but actually that forecast value add, going back to the work by Files and Goodwin, of course, and Lawrence and uh, uh, the original EPSRC project with Costas Nikolopoulos and, and so forth. Um, has then taken by Mike Gillian and been really expanded into this forecast value added uh, um, management hype that, that is in forecasting. And measuring statistical accuracy against the naive is already very hard, and you will probably be surprised how few times the statistical engines outperform the naive. And then judgment doesn't outperform the statistics, nor the naive. Um, but this is a tough benchmark, so we evaluate it against that as well. Um, and this is a landscape. So at the bottom, I'm showing you the errors um, biased off as many other companies actually look at this in cost weighted mean absolute percent error. So they take the absolute error, which is 
fairly robust if you think about it. They sum them all up, weight them with the cost and the divided by the total actuals that are there. Um, and uh, so it's biased towards expensive items. It's biased against large volume items, um, but uh, it is the way they measure this. Of course, we also replicated this with all the other beautiful measures, including um, I personally, we often communicate with Esme, but I know that um, Ivan is probably turning in his grave just me mentioning this. But we also looked at root mean square scaled errors. We looked at, at maze and others. The results are pretty consistent and the results are what's worrying. So Biostoff had some current models that we're using uh, with the planners um, and they were better. They outperformed the naive, so they were adding value statistically, which is not something you often see. If you look at some of Robert's uh, Robert files and studies then uh, and also some of the others, you will see that some companies actually don't don't routinely outperform the naive, right? So by the way, these are weighted MAPES errors. So 33 is at the bottom, 69 is at the top. I can't show you everything in, in between due to non-disclosure reasons with Biostoff, but um, but I think you get the gist of it, how much this is, and they're significantly adding value. And then we also have the runtime, right? We want to see how 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 long things run. Next, let's have a look at the statistical methods that are out there, right? These, you know, exponential smoothing has been around for a while, so you need to outperform that. And you can see that we have some exponential smoothing models here that are at the front of things, right? Uh, Arima with Fourier is actually doing quite well. ES outperforming ETS. Not sure if Ivan is in the call, maybe he'd be happy to hear that. Unfortunately, auto SS Arima not really outperforming auto Arima. GLM is there, BATS, TBATS, Thief from Nikos um, uh, up here. Really much more runtime intensive, but very, very accurate. We find that in many cases. And we have also actually built a wrapper with many different forecasting algorithms that um, if you select over many algorithms from statistics, you can actually outperform all of them. OK, so that's stats and the benchmarks. But where is where is our machine learning? Where where are the, the AI models? The machine learning models first profit bag DTS from Heidman. Profit is really, really time consuming, but uh, but it's it's not really outperforming ETS. Random Forest are down here. K nearest neighbors, XG Boost, BSTS actually worse than the moving average. XG Boost just basically outperforming it, but worse than the majority of all the other algorithms. And then when we move on to the AI models, all the deep neural networks, deep belief neural networks, structural auto encoders, NetR, MLP, um, NN4 uh, with extreme learning machines or MLPs, right? All used in their standard settings, actually. All of these algorithms fail to outperform simple benchmarks, right? They may be they may be better than STLM, and maybe they're you know I've I've never GMDH actually had an infinite error, right? It's just so it didn't converge on any of these 500 or 600 time series, um, but it was really worrying. So these are this is our old AI model that we built. They call it internally 99B. So it was on par with statistical models, but it was no longer outperforming statistical models. So it was about time after 10 years that we review that and um, but we didn't have any more data. Uh, oh, by the way, we also did something like an efficient frontier. So if you think about all the algorithms we've calculated, they're all in R, they're all in or the rest in Python that I'm not showing here at the moment. Right? if you look at that and you actually do model selection on the test set, so you pick the best model of all the models that's there, right? It, irrespective of the, the challenges in model selection and parameterization, you can actually only get to a level of about 33% accuracy. And that's how we estimate like an efficient frontier. How What is the gap between the algorithms, what they're currently achieving and where we can get? And you can see that from the naive, we've actually exploited a lot of the patterns that are there um, because you can never achieve a model selection accuracy as good as picking off the, the 50 or 60 algorithms you have, picking the one that is best on the test data. Right, so we can at least measure a lower bound because some companies think the lower bound of forecast error is zero. That's not the case, right? It's the, the randomness that is inherent in the data. But however you measure that, we measured it this way. So unfortunately, most of the latest generation of deep neural networks we can we couldn't implement because they were all worse what we already had. So, but there were some new algorithms that were there. So maybe we can look at some of these new algorithms like Thief and others and Borrow some ideas from stats. Why are they more? Why is TBATS more in, uh, better? What what does Auto Arima do better? Uh, what has ES done better than ETS? Um, what is Auto Arima with Fourier doing to improve on Auto Arima and Thief Temporal hierarchic, uh, Hierarchical Aggregation? Um, and by the way, there's some, there's quite a bit of evidence why these things don't work. Right, just a simple a simple outlier will completely confuse. XG boost or profit or BSTS. So if you look at the actual forecast, you will see that that these algorithms really uh, don't perform well. 
Um, and you may think like, oh, maybe that's just the data set. You're right, but we also replicated this for many other data sets, not just the biased of Austria one, but we also replicated this for Bosch and SAT and Verd and Hub, you know, Ahala, container traffic, um, pharmaceutical sales, B2B sales, and we often find that these algorithms actually don't work. So what could we do? And I'm running slightly short on time, so let me move forward, right? So how do we do that? How We saw that neural networks need data, and how could we create better algorithms? Well, traditionally, we've built a model just on autoregressive lags, and that's what I would say. That's a, the second or the first generation of neural network models. But we know how, how human experts look at the data, and they would typically extract information. They would actually not only look at the time series, they would actually take the time series, they would extract it. They would extract a trend pattern. They would extract a seasonal pattern. They would extract maybe a second seasonal pattern. They would actually maybe extract outliers. And all of these could be used as features to, to feed to a neural network. They also typically wouldn't just look at a single time series of one suntan lotion. They would actually look at the time, the aggregate data of all suntan lotions. They would look at the aggregate data of all the sales in Germany, maybe the conventional retail channel versus the Amazon retail channel. One is growing, one is shrinking. They would aggregate, disaggregate all of this, slicing and dicing it. Maybe they would even aggregate them in a temporal way from, from months to quarters, from quarters to years, just like Thief is doing it. But just, just because you have a single time series doesn't mean you don't have no features, right? We still have features. You can go well beyond autoregression and dummy variables. And that's what we did. So um just going to jump over this of course you can have, you can transform data take first differences take seasonal differences you have lots of evidence uh, from seasonal diagrams and so forth so that's what we did we just built the second one with automatic feature generation and feature extraction we then permutate the features we auto select the features we auto select this and that's basically how we do it and um, then we put everything into an ensemble um, bagging typically works well for us. We don't do inverse boosting. It's too time consuming and it adds a few percentage points here. We would never do boosting. Uh, look at Devin Barrow's PhD of yesteryear. Um, I think that doesn't really work when you have outliers and randomness. But we did that and uh, this is basically how it looks like. So we then build a wrapper of a neural network and we start with very simple features. And I think I probably need to fast forward a bit because we will still want to have some time for questions. And then we build more complicated ones that add uh, additional features in and even more complicated ones. And they're able to approximate things differently. And um, by the way, we have built quite a few things in order to look inside the new network, like learning rate, uh, um, finishing gradients and so forth, uh, looking at improving some of this. So uh, going beyond the kind of models that we built many years ago, we can now actually build much better algorithms. And what's the effect of that accuracy of building, of creating data? Um, maybe I'm not going to show it to you in this, but um, this is um, basically the naive model, the SAP APO models that are available. And by the way, most of the other packages, um, whether it's IBP from SAP or S4HANA, they're not better than APO. Uh, they may be newer. These were our old neural network models that we had with an error. Uh, we were improving quite a bit on top of uh, this, the APO models. And the new, the latest ICAST models with neural networks improved by 15 percentage points which is um, quite a bit, if you think about it, 15% um, 15, uh, 15%, sorry. And the improvements are robust against A, B and C um, across all the categories. So you can actually apply this to important items, but also if you needed to automate the long tail and had unimportant items. So what does that mean? Remember this, this graph that we had here. So the latest algorithms that we implemented actually came in here. We actually built the first version that was much more time consuming and uh, circulated through a whole range of different architectures um, that was more time consuming than Thief, not as much as bagged ETS or Profit, but it outperformed all the other packages, including ES, ETS. And the final one, the final AI model that we now have is actually improving roughly um, 15 percentage points on top of the old AI model that is down here. And, and unfortunately, combining that with statistics didn't actually improve, so we had to go a pure AI route. Um, but in the end, by artificially generating data, we were able to improve accuracy. So five percentage points, 15% error improvement. If you think that one percentage point um, accuracy is often considered to be, well, for Johnson Johnson, it's it's eight million uh, US dollars per year. For other companies that are, have documented this, like Tesa, it can be one and a half million euros per year. So five percentage points could be quite a significant saving in just from the inventory costs year on year. So altogether, we managed to do that, but not with 
the standard algorithms of the beautiful big neural networks. Now, I've not tried any of the, the recent Nixler innovations. I saw what they presented uh, at the last ISF in Charlottesville. Um, I think there they were they were struggling to uh, to forecast the, the airline passenger time series. I think they've come a long way now. I've not really seen the latest generation of AWS, what they're doing. We're working on that right now. But um, but looking at some of the high, most hyped algorithms, certainly they didn't seem to yield benefit on the sparse industry data that we are looking at, right? I'm not saying that these don't work on electricity data or maybe high frequency data, um, but they certainly don't work on sparse data with few exogenous variables. And maybe just uh, the final thing to say, management expectations, that is an important thing because that also almost killed it. Um, so we had different stakeholders in the project and um, they all had different expectations. So from the presentation we just gave you, um, we had different understandings that people took away. We thought, wow, this is incredible. We're improving uh, five or eight percentage points on mature items in Austria. So we need to test more countries. We need to look at how to forecast new items. But other people didn't get the subtleties of that. Senior management thought, OK, you're improving uh, 15 percentage points, not 15 percent, you know, 6 percent or 8 percentage points are 15 percent of the original level of improvement. So um, they measured something else and they didn't think about mature items where you actually have enough data to train a new network on. They thought you would improve on everything. And the local planning teams, they said, yeah, we want to improve accuracy, but actually we would just want to have any better forecast, but we don't want our daily work to become slower. And IT also had expectations. They didn't want the they didn't want the models to, to run for a very long time, but we hadn't talked about that. For us, it's clear, bigger neural networks, more recent neural networks require more time, but it was like that. So what happens? We went live. We were so excited with the improvements in accuracy, outperforming every statistical model that is out there in the R landscape, that um, we decided, well, who needs to run in parallel? Why don't we? We had a POC, it's successful in Austria. Let's go live with Austria. So we actually went live. There's no parallel pilot. What could possibly go wrong, right? So we switched off the old models. We replaced it with the new models, which also meant we couldn't compare to the old models anymore. And we went live. The first thing that was a curveball is there was a massive product relaunch in Austria. Now, for every product relaunch, the planners actually have to go into APO and execute a manual forecast. That's not a problem if you have a statistical model. It is not. It is a problem if you have a new network model because now the run times are pretty long. And if you go from 10 seconds to two minutes per model, because you're now building a 20 uh, new network ensemble models, if you do that, then you're not sitting there for an hour. You're actually sitting there for two days. And it means you're behind with all the other activities. So they had real world pains with the run times. And, you know, they weren't happy about this. So they said, well, these models aren't good. We thought they were good in accuracy. How could they know they forecast three months in advance where they just weren't fast enough? The second curveball came in March when customer negotiations between Barstorff and their customer, one of the major retail customers broke down and um, they basically delisted the Barstorff products temporarily, which means no more sales, which means your sales actually dropped to zero. And of course, we didn't forecast that in December, a few months before. Um, and we didn't run in parallel, so we couldn't see how another algorithm would also not have forecasted that to measure it as a forecast value add. The second curveball was that uh, a month later, they agreed on this, they relisted everything and they caught up. So all the zero sales that were the month before were caught up with 200% uh, of the volume, which of course we didn't calculate or we didn't forecast beforehand. And there was no run in parallel to measure this, that no algorithm could do it. The next month we reported our first Four months ahead forecast accuracy. It was bad. Management was unhappy. Everybody was in escalation mode. So we did quite a lot of things. And Chris actually invested a lot of time to, deep, to do deep dives to explain these things, to have a project presentation. We sped up the server. We then invested quite a lot into um, improving and enhancing the runtime of the models um, because the runtime was a big issue as well. And um, then presented in Amsterdam last November. So this is what we've done here. We're currently live with this, uh, but we haven't rolled it out. Just the runtime, we're able to reduce the runtime quite a bit. And uh, that's maybe as a closing note, we often forget about runtime in these models. The current GPT models are growing exponentially in learning time and also in energy usage that um, at the moment they're there, you know, a single large AI model can range from 3 million to 12 million for trading cost. Um, on a large data set can be 30 million. OpenAI estimates that the cost of training model 
the next model for them will cost somewhere between 500 and 700 million US dollars by 2030. And Mark Zuckerberg just said, to train our Llama models, we need one moderate sized nuclear power plant day in, day out only for ourselves. So there's a real concern that you improve accuracy, but you suddenly have four or five million euros as CPU time cost added to your budget, which of course doesn't help. And uh, and that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I'm, I hope we have some questions, Kandrika. Um, this is about us. So if you're interested, follow us on, on LinkedIn or contact us. We're actually hiring consultants at the moment. So please do reach out. And, um, and one more shout out, a PhD student, at the center, Carlos is currently doing a demand forecasting survey from 2023 on the latest practice. Please, if you can, take part in that. Uh, we're doing that together with Carlos and Annalena Sachs, and it would be a pleasure. So thanks a lot. And maybe we have some time for questions uh, left. Kandrika. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sven. It's very interesting. Um, so we have several questions here. So the first one is from Philip. Um, Sorry if I butchered your name. Um, stop. Um, hi, Sven. How would you decide which or how many autoregressive inputs to use within the neural model? Yeah. For example, if I'm forecasting daily data, where should I start in selecting the inputs? Actually, that was one of the biggest problems in neural network specification for a long time, right? How do you do feature selection? If you look at uh, some of the regression, non, non time series, uh, if you look at the general regression literature, there's a lot of um, uh, challenges there in feature selection. Actually, if you look at feature selection in classification, right, new networks for classification, I think there are 30 or 40,000 papers written about feature selection, and there are very few in feature selection for forecasting. So Nikos Korensis actually wrote his PhD about this. There's a lot of things you can borrow from, from the statistical literature, right? ACF functions, PACF functions. Um, you can look at core entropy. You can look at statistical approaches to look at linear dependence. If if, an, if there's linear autoregressive structure in the data, you can you know you don't have to look for nonlinear autoregressive structure, but if you find linear autoregressive structure, that's a good point. Right? Of course you have to make sure that all the other stuff is accounted for, like um multicollinearity, right? Co-integration. Uh, um, think about co-integration, right? So you have two non-stationary non time series, then everything will be relevant to each other. But it is a big problem. I would do it iteratively. I would look for the autoregressive structure. Um, ACF, PACF is a good way, and then do it. Seasonality, of course, is something you can iteratively get, get rid of. So if you have daily, if you, did you say daily electricity or, uh, or uh, weekly electricity data? I think we actually published a paper at an I, uh, IJCNN conference many years ago. Uh, how to do that, but um, think about how you would specify that with with in an ARIMA context, and then I think you're on a good track to do it. But you don't have to be brute force about this, right? If you're talking about this, we we I, we typically use multi-layer perceptrons. They are autoregressive neural networks. If you have a moving average process, finding out that you have a, a moving average process means that you have to specify your input lags differently, right? You would actually, have, or you take a recurrent neural network, not a feedforward network. And then you specify this uh, there, but you definitely need to take care of seasonality. Uh, do you do seasonality through autoregression or moving average, or do you do it with dummies or sine cosine pairs? Um, I think there's there's quite a lot of things out there. So um, I think yeah, I think there's there's quite a lot of it's an interesting area that I'm very passionate about because we have like 20 or 30 papers in forecasting um, how to specify the features that are relevant for our problem and we have non-stationarity so everything appears to be uh, um, appears to be relevant but it's a real a real challenge which i'm sure the econometricians share right they but look to econometrics right they really know they have best practice on how to build this iteratively yeah. great question okay. yeah yeah so the second question is from um george Puretos, uh, are all the errors represented out of sample? I think it's referred yes. to it refers to the Your, good good point. So yeah, we always we do an out of sample evaluation, uh, multi origin, fixed horizon. Uh, Biased off actually, um, they have two relevant forecasting horizons, M1 and M3, which is actually two steps out and four steps out. It, it coincides with the way that they do their inventory and their production planning. So these are two lead times which are important to them. This is cost weighted uh, MAPE. And we actually forecast from a particular point in time out of sample. 
into the future and then we give it one more data point so it's rolling time origin and then we take the average over all the errors over that period in time so okay. all of these are out of sample errors they are rolling origin uh, fixed horizon errors um i don't really like k-fold cross validation or things like that if you have that because we simply don't have enough data here um but you can be of course more accurate but it's sparse data right it's it's two data it's two horizons we have a 12 month test set that we withhold remember we have few day few years of data if we withhold one year for testing i would like to withhold two years of testing but that means i, I go from four years to to three years of model building what is my network going to learn so these are some of the fatal trade-offs it's um, it's the best we can do, yeah, but then so in the practice mm -hmm. we 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 run it in practice next to the original system, and then you actually see how the errors come in as we roll forward. Yeah. So another question is from uh, D. Yes, um, are this model open source, especially for the I test model? And it seems to be that the sparse model works very well. Sorry. Stats model works very well for sparse data. I yeah. think that maybe the reason why, um, and also feature selection as well. I think we touch upon yeah. feature selection. I can't really. This is a, a good observation. I can't really generalize it in a scientific way with lots of evidence, but I think to me it's 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 um, it's intuitive that there's a congruency between the data that we have and the algorithms we have developed to work on that data. And if you go back to the ARIMA books, Box and Jenkins, you look at exponential smoothing, we actually have time series data, typically monthly, and surprisingly industry, production, consumer goods, pharmaceutical industry, is still working with data on that paradigm. And exponential smoothing, I think Ivan also had recently done a post on, on LinkedIn, is is a workhorse that is very, very hard to beat. It's a tough benchmark to beat exponential smoothing because it just does really well. It's a moving average process. It's mean reverting. It has a few patterns like trend and seasonality. You don't have a lot of external variables. You just have exogenous shots and it's very hard to outperform. But if you will move to weekly data, you have very different patterns. If you go to daily data, hourly data, which of course exists in electricity and in, in Logistics, I think you'll see different different patterns emerge and different algorithms do well. We once did a competition called the uh, a transportation competition with data from Michel Yvon, where we had daily data, weekly data, monthly data, quarterly data, and yearly data. And you could see that the neural networks were really not doing well at the time for yearly and quarterly and monthly data, but mm -hmm. they were getting better and better for the higher the data frequency got. The more data you had to train the models on, the better relatively in the performance they got, and the harder it was to specify the ARIMA models to estimate the coefficients, right? Um, because you have to, everything is non-stationary, first and seasonal differences. So it was really challenging to uh, build statistical models. They weren't developed for this, but newer networks did better. So I think you, this is something to, it's interesting, horses for courses, you know, we, we, we need the right algorithm for the right, like the second generation neural networks for the second generation data. And maybe the third generation neural networks work well on third generation data. I think it's a really interesting topic that is really at the heart of operational research, really. Yeah. Classif classifying algorithms into <laughs> the data set. Um, I think the last one here is about, is there any way, classic way to identify forecastable time series? I think that's the question. To identify forecastable time series? Hmm. Forecast, yeah. So whether, whether we can identify uh, time series is forecastable or not forecastable. Um, so if we, if, we, if we find unforecastable time series, then you yeah. should not go forward. And then, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think it goes in this area of forecast value added, right? How do you, you know, wh where do you, where can you invest your time? And um, I think there are some companies out there that have something like a forecastability index, and they measure this mm -hmm. forecastability uh, um, for each time series. But for me, we actually do it that we actually run a standard model set with model selection, and we measure the improvement to the naive. And then you take the average improvement to the naive, and that gives you for a thousand time series some and a feeling how much the value add is and that's the forecastability index but the problem is you never know how much you can improve like if you if you picked a different algorithm form if you had additional variables if you collected order book data how much better could you get so i don't like this to say this item is not forecastable because with the right explanatory variables it could be perfectly forecastable 
and it sends a, the different message. But it's a great question. I think we probably could use some some of these these ideas. I think Heinemann was working on that with clustering, try to identify the patterns that are contained in the time series data set. But um, I don't have a good answer for that. But I think measuring against the naive is probably a good good approach. Yeah. Uh, so when do you still have time to answer one question? Uh, yeah, one more. But I think I don't want to keep the other people in this chat. Yeah, so they're all yeah. very polite and stay in here. I have enough time. Um, but um, OK, yeah. So I, just one last question. Um, so the question is here is about feature selection in sparse data. Um, I'm not sure here. Well, the question is multivariate. Okay, so to be honest, I don't really understand the question. I, I think um, you, I know what you mean. So like um, if feature okay. selection works on sparse time series data. Um, well, the question is, what is the feature, right? What are the features that you're trying to do? And I think that the answer is you first need to think about generating features in order to then select them. But feature selection is is an MPR problem, right? Because you have all these permutations running empirical accuracy and you have very little data to evaluate it on. Right. So there are some tricks and tips that we have built in in order to try to, to do this robustly. Can we get better? I'm sure we can. But um, if you have any ideas in the matter, join Lancaster as a, as a PhD student or just come by as a postdoctoral researcher and we can work together on that because I think that is really where things are. Yeah. So the lesson is you don't need a more complex algorithm. If you're good at feature selection and feature creation, you can probably outperform something as sophisticated built by Facebook or Google or Amazon. Um, and uh, I think that's really encouraging. That that's possible. Or if you want, just come to join ICAST for a summer internship. You're always welcoming people with, with great ideas to work with us. That would be in Hamburg. Lancaster is, of course, even, even more lovely, of course. Uh, so come come join Lancaster as well. But uh, and if you have any more questions, please reach out um, mm -hmm. by email or on LinkedIn. In the forecasting, we have a LinkedIn group for the yeah. for the forecasting center, and then we can we can continue the conversation there, please. Yeah. So I think we just pass uh, six past um, three p.m. here UK time. So thank you, Swen, for your talk. So uh, see you guys in the next two weeks. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye. -bye. Have yeah, a great bye -bye. weekend. Bye. You too.